yeah so anyway i hadn't appreciated that and therefore i didn't really have enough money saved up so suddenly i was having to balance zero percent credit cards and things like that and then not only was i having to save money for next year's tax and the year after tax but i was also back paying my tax yeah that took me a good couple of years to like unravel that was steve reflecting on the whole finance thing of being self-employed the kind of impact that that has on your cash flow and the surprising tax bills that you've got to settle save money for and different ways that you've you've got to make sure you've got that security in place fascinating insights by steve in this podcast interview uh, he's a fellow freelancer and you really do need to check out his video log vlog his podcast for freelancers as well but in the meantime listen to my interview with him you might learn something staying alive uk share your story welcome to the share your story podcast steve how are you today i am well thanks for having me really great to have you on the podcast i'm a, a massive fan of the work that you do particularly your vlog your podcast um yeah i'm learning loads of stuff and i i, I have to say also it is so great to see what see someone who's sharing about the work that they do in a very vulnerable and authentic way and you know most of the time you see people talking about their work and their business and it's all like yeah everything's great i've got no problems i'm you know doing all the things i need to do and it's not real and what you've done in in your communication online i think yeah show shows that it's real so thank you for that thank you for that well thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know there's, there's no point pretending no exactly exactly and it's very refreshing and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more but we're going to start right at the beginning and my first question I ask everybody is tell us a little bit about your personal life and with that I mean where were you born have you moved around around the world anywhere or the UK a bit about your education your journey through school how that all went and then and then we'll take you to where you now live and then we'll we'll get into the kind of work thing and, and the detail of that <laughs> well on the plus side this, this this story is not exotic uh, <laughs> uh it is very short in that i am um, i was born in hertfordshire uh which is just north of london in the uk and that's where i still am uh other than like a few years at university down on the south coast of england um and maybe a year living in london um i've i've lived out in hertfordshire uh so so that's where i am uh I yeah so I mean that's I mean that's kind of it I did the whole school thing school was good enjoyed school uh did A levels and went to university to do media production because mm. I always wanted to work in radio that way, like even when I was 8 wow uh that was kind of yeah i remember we had to write our like we ha at primary school we had to write our biographies as if we were older uh, and I said I was a DJ for Radio One, uh, working on the chart show, because uh, I used to love that show at the time, mm. and that I had run the London Marathon. Uh, and I basically, I came to my senses about running the London Marathon. <laughs> but I did actually become a DJ and end up working on the radio. And uh, whilst I obviously didn't host the Top 40, I did work on it as an assistant producer. So I did uh, kind of do that as well. Um, yeah, I, I, so I did, I went to uni, did media production, which was also video, uh, TV stuff. I mean, this was just as the internet was kind of kicking off. So it was like 97, I suppose, yeah. 98. I remember f they gave us email addresses and none of us knew what to do with them, <laughs> put it that way. And mm. I also remember seeing like, cause this was like the first dot com bubble type thing. There was a website, someone showed me in one of the computer rooms. Uh, I mean, that, that kind of dates it, the fact that there was a room for computers rather than all of us having one. Yes. Uh, so we, I remember some, somebody showing me a website where 
you could buy shoes online and like you could you could revolve the shoe and look at the shoe and i was like who would buy trainers off off a computer yes this is, and now of course buy everything off of a computer yeah. yeah i just i i wish i'd i'd had a bit more open mind in this yeah. uh, to, to that scenario so yeah so i did video and audio and then i i worked for a radio station down there not not like a student one the actual was that your first um, job then straight in after uni or well kind of i it, like i did bits of radio when i was like maybe 14 15 mm. out where i lived wow um like community radio type stuff yes. and i did hospital radio and things like that which was kind of like the, the that was kind of the the route into radio yes uh, back then and then yeah while i was actually still studying a new radio station launched and so i wrote to them and said can i have a job and they gave us a show in the evening and then i used to cover shifts during the day as well that was kind of what i did mm. but as i came to the end of my studies uh, a new radio station was launching in hertfordshire of where i was obviously from and the guy who was running that had actually seen me when i was 14 <laughs> doing a show and had always wanted to launch a radio station and had remembered my name and tracked me down to see if i was still doing radio um and offered me a job <laughs> so <laughs> So actually, my yeah, my first job out of university was on the radio, like a newly launched station. So literally, we were having to add the songs onto the computers and stuff like that. Yeah, um, and it was yeah, it was great. Really, that was that was kind of my route in, and then I stayed at that same place for I don't know, probably twelve, thirteen years. Wow! Before, before going self-employed. Yeah, yeah, I know. Somewhere along the line, probably in amongst the early starts, <laughs> a little bit of ambition must have uh, must have gone, I think, because I um, I think I got comfortable. And also, I, you know, I started off like doing a mid morning show uh, and scheduling adverts. But by the end, I was doing the breakfast show and I was also the program manager. And, you know, so it's not like I just stayed in the one role. Hmm. But, um, but yeah, effectively, I just stayed at that one station. But what I did used to do was pretty much for the whole time was freelance on the side. Yes. So I mentioned earlier that I assisted, produced on the chart show, but that was because I wrote to like independent production companies in London mm. and uh, basically did some work experience for free. And then when they liked me enough, cheekily said, can you, you know, pay me to do some of this as well so i started making documentaries um and working on you know various shows that they made so i did freelance work on the side i started doing script writing um i had knew some people in the bbc by then so they invited me to do script writing for some projects online projects as well yes, yes. Uh, and then i did copywriting for them so i was always dabbling in extra things on the side but it wasn't necessarily because i felt i needed the income it was just so that i felt i was flexing i don't know i guess my creativity or not feeling like i was staying in one place even though yes. i blatantly was yes so uh, presumably the the job at the radio wasn't full day wasn't a full day or or how did that work well it kind of was uh it was you know it would have been like an eight hour Oh, okay. you know, it would have been like a nine to five, except that, I mean, for most of it, I was working maybe from 5 a.m. until, yes. you know, half one or two or whatever it would have been. Right. So, yeah, um, you know, by the time we had kids, I used to duck out of there at about 12 and then get home and pick up our son from nursery so I could look after him in the afternoon. But even then, I would still be doing some freelance writing on the side Yes. Um, at that point as well. I remember sitting on the bus on the way to pick him up, writing, mm. you know, like writing uh, for radio prep services and stuff. So, so freelancing um, yeah. got into your blood at quite an early stage then, didn't it? Yeah, it felt like, um, you know, a lot of the media industry, I guess, is probably freelance. But I remember... It was just that whole thing of if I wanted to do 
like work for big radio stations or work on big things then that yeah that was the way in so yeah it felt it felt quite natural mm. to be earning money that way brilliant so and then then the transition what finally convinced you then to to move away from the radio station yeah so i i remember one of my friends uh had come across something called people per hour he was hiring people through uh, one of those freelance job sites yes. for his company and he said you should put yourself on there as a as a writer so i uh so i did that and when you fill in your profile you know i was saying i'm also a presenter and i can edit video and audio and blah 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 yes and uh it was actually people per hour themselves who decided to make some videos and they so i was doing writing work but they were looking for videos and so they decided to search their own database and found like camera people but they they found this bloke who could present yes me and so i i presented a video for them but then i i basically said to them look you know i could i could also as well as doing this i could script it and i could uh present it and i could also edit it and so yeah basically i persuaded them to give the whole shebang to me yeah and i i hired a videographer to film for me and then i started making videos for them that way yes uh, and so that that sort of became a regular bit of income. Mm. And then online video was taking off at the time. This is about, I don't know, six years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. And so I was getting more work online to do with making videos, both online and actually in the real world, real people that I was meeting. Like maybe I might go around a trade show and interview people from there because that was something I did for people per hour. And so people saw that. Yeah. Uh, and so all of these things were sort of building income. They were building confidence, but they were also taking up more and more time. So it was getting to the point where maybe I might be up until like 11 or 12 o'clock at night, but yeah. then getting up at 4 a.m. to go and do a breakfast shift on a radio station, as well as then looking after our son in the afternoon. So I was just getting, yeah, you can't do that for too no. long. And then that kind of tied in with us having our second child and us contemplating what life would be like when my wife went back to work. Like, did we want to do the whole, you know, like how would we drop the kids off? Our son was about to start school. So like, would he go to a breakfast club? And we didn't, whilst there's you know, nothing wrong with that, lots of people have to do it. We yes. thought maybe we don't have to do it. Mm. Maybe, maybe I could, I've got all this work. Maybe there's more work out there. And so, yeah, that's basically when I handed my notice in. And um, and decided to concentrate on doing video and audio for businesses, which is what I do now. Uh, and I thought I would probably be, you know, doing bits of script writing for people, little bits and pieces of video production, um, you know, sort of selling my skills in that way. And over time, it's kind of developed into more. I, you know, I hire, I don't just hire videographers, but I also hire animators and I hire other scriptwriters and other voiceover people. So it's not all based on my talent or skill or skill set. Yes. But I hire other people so that we can do bigger and better and more creative things. And um, so, yeah, it's really grown over the past four, four or five years. And you don't, and, and again, those people are also freelancers again. So you keep it within that freelance network or? Yeah. So I don't employ anyone. No. I, they're all freelancers based on the project, even though I collaborate regularly with a lot of particular people. Yes. Uh, it's yeah, it is all based on the sort of freelance model uh, as it were. And then a huge chunk of my day is still, based around the kids around being there in the morning and dropping them they're now both at school yeah so dropping them both at school and being there at you know, half three or whatever to pick them up in the afternoon yes so um so yeah i work intensely during the day and then maybe in the evening if i need to and then alongside that do my podcast where i interview different freelancers and then i do the vlogs as you mentioned as well yeah. so and yeah. articles and things yeah, that's 
you're packing a lot in because, I mean, I, I guess not everybody knows how much time it takes. But I mean, I know on your website, you say, oh, I produced this vlog on my iPhone. Uh, you can do that too for your business. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm kind of going, yeah, I'd love to do it. But and I'm kind of looking at how you produce it. And I can see the clips. Uh, I can see the kind of the feet. I can see the camera in the trees when you're running past. Um, I notice all of these things and I'm going, there's no way I can do that. It takes so much time. And then having to edit it all together with the music, with the um bits of pieces coming in and out and some of the intro which is like the summary of all of the things and i'm going yeah i'm a, i get i suppose in a roundabout way i'm saying you're pretty good at what you do <laughs> <laughs> well the thing is though you see is that i uh, i like video and audio is is my job yeah right so it, it is totally possible for people to film with iPhones that oh. whole all, my whole vlog is filmed it's, so it's in HD but it's on an iPhone it yeah. looks amazing when it's got good light yes uh, so which is why a lot of it I, I film walking outside but um yeah I mean let's, let's, yeah okay so I'm an I'm an editor but that's something that's a skill that I've picked up over time and I've developed through practice and doing it yes of course and and you look at basically any YouTube, I, you know, I don't call myself a YouTuber, but, but if you look at any YouTuber, they are all people who, have, most of the time, self-taught themselves to edit. Yeah. Stuff. And a lot of vlogs aren't as intricate as mine are. You know, I try and fit a whole week into you know, filming each day into like under ten minutes. Yes. Which is why I keep it so fast moving. I do think keeping it fast moving keeps it watchable for a long period of time but a lot of things is, they don't have to be that long they don't have to be that fast it could be you know some people have one fixed camera and then they cut between it you know you just watch different people's styles yeah uh, and ultimately if, if you were doing it for a business you could hire someone to do that for you yeah. so i i was helping a, a girl who was launching a new like hair brand and i suggested to her that she should vlog about it so that her audience would get into it like buy into her product before she even had a product to sell mm. and you know she could film herself going around and you know behind the scenes stuff of what she was doing using her phone but then give it to somebody else you know someone like me for example yes. to edit it right so then you're hiring a professional who who will take it you know a fraction of the amount of time that you would yeah but, but you end up with a video, but you've still filmed it yourself. Mm. Um, but also I encourage her to get on like Instagram stories, for example, and just get comfortable being on the camera and filming things. And, uh, and you soon start to realize, you know, different angles and what might be interesting and what, what gets a reaction from people. Uh, so it doesn't, you know, vlogging doesn't have to be a YouTube video. It could be, uh, just doing daily stories on Instagram yes. as well, in which case you don't have to edit it at all. Mm. You're just you're just putting it out uh, as you go along. Yeah, and there are, you're right. There are many different ways of of tackling that. That's for sure. Um, and I think also these days it's about how do you make it watchable that people want to watch it because not only is the content interesting, it's also uh, an engaging and well-produced bit of content because it also find that people can go and talk on camera and you see a lot of Facebook lives and Facebook live was really super interesting to begin with what people were doing, but now they're just kind of waffle on for like, half an hour and you're bored after two minutes. People just talking, <laughs> people just talking on camera nonstop is now people haven't got the attention span, do they? They, they want something that is reasonably quick, but also how do you keep there? And, and it comes back to something I'm passionate about and you are as well, which is storytelling. You know, once you tell a story, 
you tell your story about what's going on in your life as a freelancer in your business. And it's an interesting story to watch and witness what's going on. So Yeah, for sure. Sto- stories stories are important. And um in fact recently I I did I gave speaking a go, you know, at, at events and conferences and stuff. Yes. And that was new to me and so I started studying it. And I began to realise that the best, you know, conferences or, uh, sorry, best presentations I was watching were the ones which had a story, a strong story right at the beginning or maybe different ones woven through it. Yes. And it was always the stories that would pull you back in if you were starting to drift off. Um, And, yeah, that's why, like, doing the vlog the way I do it is, yeah, it kind of works. Like in amongst it, you get to pick up on, I guess, lessons or things that I'm, you know, learning or realizing myself or be entertained. But it's that that's why Instagram stories being called stories isn't a bad thing. Like because it it is a little snapshot of your day. And the best ones are people who are like telling some sort of narrative something to hook you in Mm. as far as what you said about like facebook live and stuff getting boring but you know that that really is about what's the purpose of doing it in the first place yes so it's never going to work if you've got no point to be doing it Mm. but equally if somebody was teaching you something that you were finding useful then you'd probably stay gripped yeah so you know what those you know, a good introduction to a live video or any video in a way would be to say, especially a live one though, is to say, you know, hello, and here's what is coming up. So maybe tell a story, but here's what's going to come up and here's what you're going to learn. And therefore in hearing that you're thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to stay listening because I want to find out how this is going to do that, that or the other to me or my business or my family or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, if it's just somebody rambling because they're next to the pool for the sake of it, then yeah, you'll probably <laughs> you'll probably get bored and switch off. I must, I must have touched yeah. on a few that were like that and went, okay, I've had enough of this. But you're right that an introduction is vitally important just to give people a flavour. And then it's a bit like a news story, isn't it? People say on the news they say. These are the headlines. This is what's coming up. And then they get into the news and then they summarize it at the end again. Um, yeah. 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 You've, 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 I think you've got to think it through. If you're going to bother doing a live thing, you've got to have a reason to do it. There's a, a really good one that I watch pretty much every week is by, um, she calls herself Social Pip, Pippa Akram. Uh, so she's a social media consultant. But every Friday at midday, she will do a Periscope live. So on Twitter, she goes live. And she basically does half an hour chatting about the latest developments in social media. So what the platforms are doing and how that could have an impact on your small business and what you could learn from it and things like that. And obviously, there's a lot of interaction, both live and afterwards as well. So she has a purpose. She's not just jumping on there and chatting about her dog or her kitchen development you know like there's a real reason for her to do it and she's made proper notes and she works her way through it just like a tv show so yeah if you expect people to give up their time to watch i think it's worth spending a bit of time thinking about what it is you're gonna do to them otherwise it's a waste of your time too yeah so um and i know people can the best way for people to find out you know, and see what's going on in your business and life is to to go and watch the vlog. But a lot of people, this may be the first time that they're hearing about you. Um, So what would be, if you don't mind, how long have you been doing the freelancing now? Uh, Four, four and a half years. Four and a half. Like as as in full time. Full time. Yeah. Yeah. So not that long. Um, So what? I mean, that was almost like setting, and I know you've been doing some of it on the journey, but kind of 100% doing freelancing for the past four and a half years or so. Let's call it five. Um, so what what are some, what have been some of the highlights for you over those past five years in terms of doing it in the way that you've been doing it? 
I think um, I think a few things have been like realizing the potential of like working with other people. One of those came quite early on when somebody asked me if I could, they sent me an email and they said, can you do this style of animation for us? And I was quite honest. I said, no, but I work with somebody who can let me get back to you, blah, blah, blah. And that was the very first kind of, project where i became a bit like a producer a project manager i was bringing in other talents to work with me to create something for somebody and actually it was a video which we ended up getting translated into maybe 15 languages because they were launching across europe so i had to find all the different translators and all the different voiceover artists for all of those countries and yeah it, it was kind of like a realization that that was possible but it didn't have to be about me but I could harness the, the skills of other people. Uh, and so I approached an animator who, who had approached me previously to write scripts for him and do voiceovers for him. This time it was me hiring him, and we still work together today very closely. Um, another time was just before we were due to go on holiday a couple of years ago when uh, I'd been sort of working on a pilot for an internal training scheme for a bank. And we were about to film a load of videos, and I got seven scripts together for those videos. And just before they were due, I was due to go on holiday. They decided they liked them so much, <laughs> they uh, they wanted to double it. They wanted like fifteen videos, and so I I was kind of torn because you know, it, to be honest, I needed the money, and I didn't want to turn it down because I thought, well, they'll go and find somebody else to do it, and then this project might never come back, and it has potential to go on for years. Yes. So I thought, well, I either turn it down or I tell my family I'm going to be missing the first few days of this holiday. You go off on your own and I'll just work on this. But actually what I ended up doing was compromising and hiring another writer. So that was the first time I'd hired another writer. Yes. And so for the next three days, he was working on them. I got up early and wrote scripts. He wrote them. He sent them to me. I edited them, sent them to the client. They were happy. They filmed them. And I got on with my holiday. But that relationship meant that actually the next batch of videos was 30 and then it was 50. And instead of just being me and one other writer, we now have like a team of six writers. And it was that, yeah, it was that moment where I was kind of like prioritizing family, but realizing I could bring on other people to work with me. Mm. Uh, and so still make the money, still make the client happy, um, but still actually have time with my family as well so that was yeah that was a a big thing really and, and that project is still ongoing today which is brilliant i love that story i'm i'm literally at the moment going through a program with birmingham city university which is called growing you and it's about small businesses looking at where they are in terms of their growth and how can they look at growing themselves even further and one of the things, I did the third workshop this morning, and one of the things they talk about in these workshops in particular is, is value add and value add through the supply chain. So it's not just value add that you can bring to your business, but who else can bring the value add in your supply chain? And that's exactly what you're now describing is that often people think they've got to bring all the value add, but actually you've been able to add value to your business by using other people. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so I never I never studied business, but yeah, that's, <laughs> it turns out that's what I did. Yeah. Um, through just realising it. And getting the pricing right was key to that, actually, like realising that, it, yeah, I know, I guess as a, the initial freelance mindset is that you bill for your time. Yes. That's kind of the starting point for most of us. But then you realize that actually you need to add a margin on top of that. So you need to start to think, well, what if I wasn't doing that work? If I was ill and I had to pay somebody else to do it, mm. what am I going to still make? It? Or in my case, if I'm hiring another writer, like what is my margin on top of that? So to, and, and then to start then to stop feeling bad about it because i still speak to freelancers for the being freelance podcast now where they're like they're almost apologizing for doing that step 
Mm. And I think that's where, as freelancers, we need to think of ourselves as businesses. Yes. So the people who call themselves businesses or call themselves entrepreneurs kind of get over that hurdle a lot quicker because they're already thinking, well, no, it's perfectly natural. I'm going to add something on top yeah um because otherwise this business won't survive very long um so yeah and, and actually since then it's it's kind of like spotting opportunities you know i've gone to existing clients and offered more services so we also offer uh document design or infographic design and uh translation services dubbing services so things which relate to the sphere of what i do things I totally couldn't do myself um, but that help them and sort of keep it all within my um, my business, my little sort of ecosystem that I've created. And actually, in a way, it's easier when you start hiring people who do things that you can't do um, because so, you know, I can't animate. I can do a very little bit, but not I can't really animate. Uh, but I can write a script. So it took me ages to think that I could give a script to somebody else. Mm. Uh, I can't translate. I can't do an infographic design. No. I, I can help them with the visual brief and outline, but I, I simply can't. I'm not a graphic designer. No. So it so it's a lot easier to start outsourcing things to people when you can't do it. Mm. Which again is where entrepreneur, you know, like an entrepreneur who des- decides to design a new type of umbrella probably can't actually design you know they might come up with a design but after that they're gonna have to give it to other but they're not gonna make a thousand umbrellas themselves no they have to go and find somebody to do it for them and so that that's kind of where freelancers can come a bit unstuck where they think they have to do it all themselves and there's nothing wrong with doing it all yourselves not everybody wants to manage other people or take the risk but it's certainly a way to grow your business yeah and and is that the way you believe it will stay for you that it's the freelance with freelancers route rather than, you know, building a studio and getting some premises and, you know, having a team in place. Well, I, I, I think for, for now, for sure. And I also think in a way, hiring premises and building studios will perhaps start to feel a little bit antiquated, like putting lots of people in buildings soon. It all, it doesn't seem to make financial sense to me anyway. No. Uh, you know, I work from home. I use a bit of co-work space. Why would I hire an office? Why would I take on the financial pressures of hiring staff when I can hire free and, and not just for hiring freelancers, but hiring the best people to do the job wherever they are in the world. Yeah. Um, it doesn't it doesn't really make sense other than the fact that it's quite nice to do a tea round and have some cakes and a drink after work sometimes mm. but you can you can start to get that if you go to a co-work space there are certain situations where of course it might make sense to have people come together in the same place yeah but for the most part uh, you know, there's there's a lot of businesses now, uh, the likes of Buffer and I, I can't remember, like uh, ConvertKit and stuff like companies who are being very explicit about the fact that their whole workforce is remote, and they yeah. come together maybe once or twice a year, but everything else is done remote. Don't, yeah. Um, so that partly answers the question <laughs> whether yeah. I, so I can still build a studio without physically having everybody in in the same place and in a way it's kind of what i'm doing i'm just letting things happen organically yes but the moment to my clients this it's still very much dealing with me they know i work with other people Mm. but it's still yeah it's still very much me and i guess i mean i i know buffer and and buffer are the best example (laughs) that you just mentioned because i i love what they stand for. I love their culture. I love the way that they have gone about doing it. And they did have premises, I think, in San Francisco for a while, and then they closed them because their ethos is you can live wherever you want in the world, basically, and do the work from there. And it is because so much can be done remotely, and it doesn't mean you can't have a meaningful business identity 
um, when people are dispersed. I, I guess the other thing as well, might be, be interesting your view on this, that if you are using other freelancers, it also gives you the flexibility because if you had a team of people with skills, you might not have all the skills in the team, right? And you might be asked to do something, um, I don't know, film with, filming from drones and no one in the team can do filming with drones, but you need to go to a specialist. You need to go to a freelancer who can do filming with drones, for example. Uh, yeah, or you can kind of turn that on its head like, and say, and I think this is all kind of like more dangerous is the fact, but what if I invest in a load of drones and somebody who can fly drones and film with drones? Mm. And so then every time a client comes to me, I'm selling them a drone. I'm like, oh yeah, this video will look great with a drone in it, even though they don't need it yes. because I've got it. Yes. And that's, you know, like I'll be saying, oh yeah, you want to have this animation look in this particular style because I have this animator who does that particular style. Right. Whereas I can be honest and pick the style that I think will suit that, that vision for the project or that vision for their budget, you know, and, and, and pick the animator within my team who ticks those boxes rather than forcing them to have a certain style because that's the person I've got on the payroll. Yeah. There, there, there are some businesses which will probably always have to be within businesses, uh, sorry, within premises, particularly like manufacturing. Of course. But, um, but for, particularly for creative industries, uh, you really don't have to. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the highlights were there some things in the in the last five years that could have been greater? So some challenges along the way. Um, I think the toughest thing early on was just not being, and I'm probably still not great at it. It's just keep. Um, it's just finances. Mm. Uh, I hadn't when I became self-employed appreciated that whole thing of uh, when you're a sole trader you end up paying you don't just pay your tax you then have to pay a bit of next year's tax uh, by the great wisdom of the way the tax system works mm. uh, whereas businesses I've since discovered because I'm now a limited company have like a year <laughs> in which to pay yes. their tax like it works in completely the opposite way mm. um yeah, so anyway, I hadn't appreciated that, and therefore I didn't really have enough money saved up. So suddenly I was having to balance 0% credit cards and things like that. And then not only was I having to save money for next year's tax and the year after tax, but I was also back paying my tax. Yeah, that took me a good couple of years to like unravel that. Um, so I think if you were, uh, you know, when you come from a PAYE being employed background. Yeah. You're just not used to that kind of thing. It all just gets done for you. Mm. Uh, mm. It, well, it does in our country anyway. Some countries, people do pay their own taxes. But yeah, doing tax returns and stuff uh, and being on top of that is, is really important to get right. And I didn't necessarily early on. And actually, for that matter, I think there was a big change when I became a limited company was that from a mindset point of view, I started to feel more like a business yes even though technically well on paper legally stuff had changed the way i was running my business hadn't in theory changed but in my head it begins to feel more like a business and you know as soon as you because when you start out you might not have separate bank accounts and I, you know if someone's listening and thinking of doing that i would hugely recommend you do uh, even as a sole trader you know keep those two things separate it it helps ingrain that business mentality, like use some financial software um, yeah. to keep track of your, your books. And it just makes everything feel a lot more professional and it keeps on top of the numbers because there's nothing worse than those pressures of finance. Um, so, yeah, that, that was probably the biggest challenge. And then mm. as I was hiring other people, uh, that then comes with the sort of risk of cash flow, I guess, because... I would be hiring someone to do something. Maybe I'd pay them whatever their terms were, seven days later, 10 days later, even if it was 30 days later, whatever it would be, my invoice to my client would always come later. Mm. So I would always have bills to pay before that. 
So, you know, that it, it takes a while for that to start to pay off, or it did for me, and for you to start to build up that buffer and bank of money uh, where you feel comfortable about paying invoices early because mm. you can and treating people the way you want to treat them. Because, um, yeah, that's difficult, especially if you start dealing with really big com- corporations who might have 45 day terms or even oh 90 God, day terms yeah. and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. So you've got to, you've got to sort of approach that the right way. I, I think you mentioned the topic about money is, is definitely the biggest thing, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, people go into business to make money <laughs> and then it's usually the last thing we get our head around because we're so excited about the product, the servers, getting that right, getting our offer right, the pricing, the strategy and all. You know, even if we do it on the fly, we do want to get that bit right. And the money thing is often ignored. And you're 100% correct. I made exactly the same mistake. I had no financial system. Well, there weren't any online systems in those days. You had to either fork out for Sage, which cost a fortune, and you didn't have these cheaper versions that are now available. And I mean, it's like anything. Now is like the easiest time to start your own business with all of the services and resources that are available. Finance mm. is is probably the top priority to get right at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I wish I'd, I'd kind of, you know, got, got that better. And, you know, I still need to get it better. I could still probably hire someone to make sure they keep on top of all my expenses in full, just because it feels like a waste of my time filling totally, in the spreadsheets yeah. and doing it online and all of that. But that said, one of my guests made a good point is that even if you hire people to enter that input and you hire the accountant and all of that, you should never let yourself get too far away from what those figures are mm. and knowing what's happening and where you're spending stuff and, uh, and what your margins So and all of that, it's yeah. still worth, sitting down and making sure you take time to understand them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, giving us some great nuggets. I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Um, If, and and you've, you've said some along the journey already. So, which is great in our conversation. If, if you had to pick just one thing apart from the finance, (laughs) if there was one other thing that you think would be just a tip for somebody that's thinking about starting their own business and in in terms of at least giving them an opportunity to get it half right to start off with um could you think of another tip oh my gosh um (laughs) (laughs) well i i think a lot i i've come to realize that a lot of everything comes down to um down to communication Mm. And, uh, yeah, well, and, and, and being honest as well, just sort of like integrity. So being honest with yourself, being honest with the people you hire and being honest with your clients, you know, like, set, like most people, for example, if you've set a deadline and it looks like things are slipping, it, so long as you're honest about that or honest about what, you know, what's happening and realign their expectations by communicating it properly, then things go a lot smoother. Yes. So, it, you know, if you, and it's, it's not just business. Obviously, that it's the same in personal relationships, just as much. Really, mm. that that communicating and setting expectations. People just want to know what's going on. Um, so, so yeah, I think that can make a huge difference. And just really thinking about what your customer or your client is experiencing and what you know what their experience of you is like i think is is worth remembering um and keeping making them feel special as soon as they've hit by or whatever it, however it might work in your business yeah and thinking about that longer term customer experience and they want to stay with you and they want to recommend you to people um yeah uh, and, and something I've realised from all of my various guests is just really how important those relationships are, mm. um, and meeting people, uh, and connecting with people, not just your clients, but other people who will either recommend you, or you might end up working with, or 
uh, yeah, it's 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 and it's not about networking as such. It's just about making relationships and meeting people. Very very important, yeah, advice. And I love the bit about the communication as well because without it, you 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 create mistrust. You know, if you don't communicate regularly, honestly not just with your clients and, and suppliers and your network, but also communicating honestly with yourself, you know, that, mm. that's vital as well. Steve, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, if people would like to find out more about you, where are all the places, if you could share, I'll put it in the show notes anyway, but if, if you could share verbally where they can find you and learn more about you or maybe hire you. Yeah, well, the, probably the best place is beingfreelance.com uh, because it will link through to my, my website. It's also uh, the place where, as well as the podcast, you can see my vlogs, uh, which will link through to YouTube. So, uh, lots of my writing and stuff it's all in that one one place of so being freelance.com and uh yeah on twitter i am at s fallen f-o-l-l-a-n-d fabulous fabulous thank you so much for your time it's really great to speak to you i will continue to enjoy and watch your many different productions and <laughs> get inspired and learn from it. I have to, I'm still sitting on the fence though. I have to admit about the, the vlog, but maybe one day I'll get the courage to do that. So do, 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 do you do Instagram stories? You know, you, you're going to, you're going to put your hands over your face now or to your head. I'm, I have been on a journey over the last few months where I'm, I'm reducing the amount that I'm doing by not wanting to get distracted. So I have actually, I've, I've stopped being active on Facebook. I've come off WhatsApp and I have come off Instagram. Mm, yeah. So the only two places I'm active are LinkedIn. And by default, because I put stuff on LinkedIn, it goes to Twitter. Um, so I'm not really that active on Twitter, just this kind of a news feed, I guess, a secondary news feed from LinkedIn. Yeah, I've become far more focused on where I want to build my relationships because yeah. using LinkedIn, I can develop much closer relationships with people than I can do anywhere else. And I used to be a LinkedIn trainer. I stopped in December. and five, For five years, I used to teach people how to use LinkedIn, but I... I decided in December I wanted to focus 100% on my storytelling business, which includes whiteboard animations. And therefore, I wanted to focus because I was getting distracted, to be honest. And it's, it's part of my journey in terms of reducing, you know, wasting time, basically, because I found myself wasting time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's totally worth if you know where your audience is, as in where your clients is, yeah. uh, clients are, or potential clients, and if that's LinkedIn, then I think putting your weight into one platform rather than many is, is totally a smart move. Um, well, we'll see hey, in you know, a year's you, time. You, you, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it depends where they depends where they are. It's it's just such a mess, LinkedIn. That's what I always find as to like the, how it shows you the stuff. Mm. Um, so, like, actually getting to know people i i find instagram really um, really good for, for for seeing people but it totally depends what you do and where they are and how you use it and how the people you want to interact with use it yes. as well so yes. yeah no worries yeah absolutely but yeah and i and i came off instagram literally a couple of weeks ago so it's all still quite new as well and it's a kind of like fear of missing out or being delighted <laughs> that I'm no longer there. <laughs> oh, I bet it feels good. Yeah. Steve, fantastic. And I, I would love to meet up with you over a coffee when you go into London. Maybe we could meet in London one day and have a further chat. That would be really great too. And um, But in the meantime, thanks for coming on the podcast and speak to you soon. All the best. Thanks again. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.